you know, this is a great, uh, great time. It's a terrific moment, uh, you know, when you can combine uh, beautiful weather. When I left St. Louis to come down here, it was spitting snow and it was 40 degrees with uh, capping off uh, a 100 birthday celebration for, uh, for Dr. Borlaug and then put that against, I think, really a, um, a critical time when, uh, you know, I think we all need to rethink and refocus on the tools and technologies that can help us achieve the uh, type of uh, sustainable yield intensification that is both so critical for food production and food security, but to give us the tools to really manage the environmental impact and footprint of, of agriculture. You know, I don't think there's either a more important time for ag innovation and food innovation um, or one where we've had, you know, more tools and capabilities to, uh, to make it happen. And, you know, the thing that I think, you know, has made this meeting so spectacular has been uh, all the uh, common bonds that, uh, that people share. You know, there's no doubt that everybody in this room understands uh, a part of their role, a part of the mission for producing a, uh, a safe and affordable food supply. Uh, and that's whether it's farmers, big or small, or, or countries around the world. You know, I certainly can tell you that that's how I view uh, the mission of my company, and that's basically how I view my own, uh, you know, personal mission as we go forward. Second, we, uh, we have a, um, each one of us, whether we knew him personally or, uh, or through an event like this, has a, uh, a bond to, uh, to Dr. Borlaug. And, you know, that was made, uh, you know, very real uh, by all of the time that I had a chance to spend with him and all the stories I've heard at this meeting and having the opportunity to, to know his uh, granddaughter, uh, Julie, and uh, his great-grandson, uh, Luke. Uh, watching uh, Luke out in the wheat field yesterday was, uh, was uh, pretty special. Uh, you know, I had the privilege earlier on this week of uh, being in D.C. and watching the unveiling of the Borlaug statue in the uh, Capitol building of the United States. He is the uh, only agricultural scientist of the hundred statues, and I can't imagine uh, a more fitting um, recognition for such a uh, for such a, uh, a great man so having that recognition being here to celebrate the uh, the hundredth uh, birthday uh, the only thing that uh, that I would tell you is if, if Norm were here and the first thing Norm would say is okay enough enough let's worry about the next hundred years so in my talk I want to lay out the uh, the path forward on on some technology and uh, address uh, a couple of topics and uh, and issues the third bond we uh, we all have is is and, and you know I think from the just the talks this morning that I had the sat in and the dialogue uh, over the last few days we all know the uh, both the opportunity and the challenge that lies ahead for uh, for our businesses for our industries for our research and for uh, for all of our efforts uh, you know agriculture is at the center of almost every discussion and you know I've been in this business since uh, leaving my dad's farm in 1970 to go to college and you know I joined Monsanto in 1981 to, to start their work in uh, biotechnology I've never seen a time where no matter where you go and sometimes it's uh, it's emotional and sometimes it feels good and sometimes it feels bad but we're in the center of every major conversation whether it's uh, water use one day biofuels or bioenergy, whether it's the environment uh, and nitrogen use or runoffs or how we improve it and cover crops. Uh, we're in the middle of health and nutrition conversations and diet and dietary patterns. And of course, nothing you know, more important than, uh, than uh, food security. I think by now you've probably got the, uh, the facts uh, deeply embedded in your brains. Uh, over the next 36 years, world population is going to go from 7.2 billion to 9.6. The FAO has revised that for good reasons because of all the success we've had in terms of infrastructure and health you know, management in, uh, in Africa. As important is the fact that you know, by the time we reach 2050, there will be 3 billion people in the middle class who are going to want to eat uh, with, with a better calorie and nutrition and more protein in their diet. The, uh, the combination here creates a, a huge challenge on food production. You know, if you say it really quickly, you know, we've got to double the food supply and just, you know, by 2050, it, it kind of goes, goes past you. That's 36 years away. I did the math. I'm 61. So you can do it yourself. 36 
plus 61, I'll be 97. Uh, people tell me, you know, demographics say I got a chance of doing that. That's not really important. You know, for me, it's three kids. It's going to be grandkids. It's a family. It's a world. It's a legacy. And I want to make sure that we make the right decisions on ag innovation and food innovation with technologies into, uh, into the future. I also believe one of the things that's so important to think about when we think about improving yields and productivity and, and supply of, of food and grain is that, you know, as population levels out, and you know, I, you know, I said 9.6 billion people by 2050, the general view is that will hit 10 billion and then probably start to decline as birth rates uh, catch up. We actually have the opportunity, and uh, I was talking this morning about uh, about the uh, the fact that uh, you know we could be seeing you know peak land in agriculture by that time frame, and any productivity we gain beyond the doubling of productivity literally gets translated into our choices at how we lessen the impact of agriculture. So I think from both a food security and from an environmental perspective, uh, you know, the, the conversation is, uh, is really uh, critical. I'm an optimist. I, I believe that we will see, you know, tremendous impact of the technologies. I also believe absolutely at the bottom of my heart that we do have the tools and capabilities to uh, achieve that, uh, that incredible goal of uh, of doubling the, uh, the food supply, doing it in a, a sustainable way. You know, the opportunity of uh, the sustainable intensification to take the best lands, produce them crops most efficiently, and, uh, and achieve those gains plays all around the world, and it's, uh, and it's absolutely, uh, absolutely critical. Now, there's no doubt that the, uh, that the, the, uh, the challenge is, is a complex one, and I'll come back and, uh, and talk about some of my thoughts and logic and it will be made even more complex by the, uh, the uh, impact of uh, global warming as we, uh, as we see that roll out into the future. This is an area that's been particularly important to us as we think through what investments do we need to make to the future, literally from where do we locate our breeding locations that need to anticipate the changing agricultural environment or the, uh, the production zones that we'll be seeing 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 years into the future to what are the kinds of uh, tools and capabilities that we'll need. You know, we, we've studied this hard. I know there's been a lot of dialogue here. We'd certainly be willing to share our views and information for with anyone here who is uh, is interested in this topic. I think it, you know, as I've kind of looked at it, there's both uh, an opportunity for foresight to mitigate a lot of the impact of climate change. There's also, I think, the uh, the opportunity to, you know, think about changing how we breed and how we select and where crops will be grown. You know, when I uh, first got into uh, to, uh, Monsanto, the uh, corn and soybean belt in the United States was Iowa, Illinois, and uh, Minnesota, and, uh, and Indiana. Today, uh, you know, the Dakotas are producing, you know, more corn and beans than, uh, than wheat, and we're starting to grow corn and soybeans in Canada. And you can translate that all around the world and see what the opportunity is for the Ukraine and, uh, and Russia, political challenges uh, not, uh, notwithstanding. A lot of people have the mental picture that, you know, the Midwest will become a, a desert with climate change. I don't think the couple of degrees that we'll see drive that, although for certain world areas, uh, you know, droughtiness uh, will be a consideration. I think by far the biggest implication of climate change are going to be those small temperature changes that change microclimatic conditions that really influence the hatch of an insect population or the outbreak of a disease. And I think one of the, the biggest consequences that we need to gear up for is multiple tools to help us address, uh, you know, an ever-evolving, uh, you know, pest population as we, uh, as we deal with these challenges. Now, I wanted uh, to highlight, and I think a couple of the talks this morning really, uh, really uh, made the point, how complex these issues really are. And uh, I would agree with that. Uh, there was a pretty cool report that came out uh, a while ago from McKinsey that kind of looked at the whole world. They looked at the energy challenges, they looked at the healthcare challenges, they looked at the agriculture and the water challenges. 
And interestingly enough, of the top 15 improvements and recommendations that they looked at, five of them related to agriculture, and two of them really related to increasing uh, productivity and, uh, and yields. And I, and I think that plays to the, uh, the importance of, uh, of what we're going to talk about. And, uh, and uh, you know, part of the reason I think that is, uh, is so critical is increasing yield and intensification sustainably of, of agricultural production is something we not only have done, know how to do, but all the collective tools that will be here in the, uh, in the future give us a, uh, a very meaningful opportunity to achieve these goals. And I think it has some of the opportunities to be the best bang for the buck investment, whether you're a private company, whether you're an NGO, whether you're a public entity, or an independent researcher as we think about the future. Now that's not to say that there aren't other approaches in terms of, of improving our distribution system, improving our storage. In fact, that, you know, there's no doubt that if we um, we improved uh, food wastage. It's a, it's a significant impact, but still we will need to invest in yield increases to be able to achieve the kind of goals that we would, uh, would uh, like to see, and particularly in everybody at this conference is, uh, has said it, and I've been, actually for me, one of the, the high points has been, I, I sense a renewed interest and renaissance in terms of using these tools to particularly drive, you know, productivity increases in both rice and wheat, which are crops that, uh, you know, have not benefited as much as corn and soybean for the reasons that uh, that you're all aware of. So, you know, a lot of my experience comes from uh, from the focus we've had on crops like corn and soybean and cotton. But I can tell you the lessons learned and the opportunity and the impact of using these tools across broad crops is uh, is uh, is significant. You know, this shows the uh, the yields in the U.S. through uh, through last year's crop. You know, we're just getting ready to put uh, seed in the ground now for uh, for uh, for this season. But you know, we've seen obviously dramatic uh, yield increases. But we are poised to see all of those types of yield increases occurring in uh, many, many other areas in the, around the world. And the one thing I want to emphasize, because a lot of times, you know, I hear the the view that you know my company is focused unidimensionally on this approach. Let me be really clear. We need all of the tools that are out there to achieve these kind of gains. And in many ways, the the science itself as well as the information and data management tools give us the capability to integrate, integrate and deliver all of these tools collectively more effectively. There is an interplay between better farm equipment and computers and better planting technique and better seeds, it's pretty obvious. There's an interplay between data management and understanding specific field conditions and when and how to plant that seed and when to protect that crop from, uh, from insects and diseases that can be made in terms of a, of a better set of decisions. I absolutely believe that this model can be replicated across other crops. And the other very important thing is, you know, just like the, um, just like the, uh, the cost of your hard drives has dropped down, and you know, 20 years ago, you know, a, a gigabyte of storage would be uh, would be thousands of dollars, and today it's virtually free. The barriers to using these tools. Um, I, I couldn't agree with, with Rob Parlberg anymore. The only barriers to using these tools is, is policies and misinformation. It's not the cost curve, it's not the learning curve, it's not any gigantic technology barrier on technology transfer or, or information uh, flow. Um, I, I want to be, again, really, really clear. We need all of these tools to, uh, to achieve the, uh, the kind of, uh, of, of capability. But the reason I focus so much on, on using this to drive to uh, sustainable intensified yield is it has multiple benefits. And, you know, we think about yield and food production, but we think about it from a, um, an environmental impact footprint Every time we improve the amount of bushels or metric tons that can be produced per acre or hectare, we reduce the cost and in inputs on a per bushel basis very, very dramatically. This is a complicated chart, and the blue ring would be 1980 to 1985 and all the way down to the last few years in the red. 
but you can see on any dimension, whether it's uh, land use or soil erosion or water applied or energy used or greenhouse gas, a very important part of, of the intensification sustainably of farming is reducing the input per unit produced. And it's extremely dramatic, and it will continue to increase. And that's what gives me the, opti you know, the, uh, the optimism that as we reach you know, 2050 and we sustainably meet the demand for food for the planet, the further intensification gives us the opportunity to take land out of farming and make better and even smarter decisions that aren't based sheerly on, um, on, uh, on hunger and, uh, and, uh, and, and food. And so I expect these to be, uh, to be continued uh, important gains and gains that I think can reflect across other crops as we, uh, as we move forward. And certainly, you know, and it's been highlighted many times at this conference, there's no crop that's more important than wheat in terms of its broad geographic footprint, its under technification, and really the opportunity to use many, many of these tools. And of course, I think there's a, you know, a tremendous interest. And I know there's been many, uh, many opportunities and uh, conversations. There's new efforts being, uh, being catalyzed. Uh, I had a chance to, to sit next to Steve Vischer last night at, at dinner, and he talked about uh, all the efforts now that the BBSRC is putting into uh, to wheat and all the different technological approaches, but you know there's efforts uh, you know across the globe that I think give us the uh, the opportunity to not only use the the tools of biotechnology for you know the obvious benefits of herbicide tolerance or for you know insect protection or virus resistance or you know drought and yield, but to uh, utilize all of the next generation tools that I'm going to talk about that I think are game changing not only in terms of uh, of the opportunity to uh, to increase uh, yields but to uh, you know help on value capture to help on uh, on uh, on benefits to the growers that really drive the uh, the adoption and penetration of the technology so one more time, I just want to emphasize, we need all these tools. And as a company, you know, we're known for, uh, for investing in, the, in the, uh, the biotech and the GMO traits. Half of the research budget that we invest in every year is in plant breeding. And increasingly, a big part of our future investment is in the area of biologicals. It's in the areas of data science and, uh, and still, you know, very important tools in crop protection. So we recognize the, uh, the need for, uh, for all of these tools and the, uh, and the role that, uh, that they can play. Now, it surprises a lot of people when, when they ask me, and you know, since October with the World Food Prize, you know, I have to tell you, I've probably spent more time kind of looking back into the early 80s and reliving a few of those stories than, uh, than I would, uh, would, uh, would ever like to remember. But, you know, the, uh, the opportunity as I look back, and I think in many ways, the greatest impact that biotechnology has had is the way that it has really transformed and changed the way we think about breeding crops today. And it all started, as you know, five or six years ago, having the, the full genomic sequence literally having the ability today to sequence a, a corn inbred genome in about a day or a rice genome and, and use that information to not only understand how we can breed literally on a gene by gene basis but how we can use that information to really decipher you know the molecular basis of, of, of heterosis and, and other important challenges that uh, that lay ahead of us a couple of points I'd highlight you know the combination of having the sequence of every crop plant that you're working with, the complete genome sequence, the knowledge of, of every one of the 35 or 40,000 genes. And every time you make a cross, being able to understand precisely those recombinations and make better decisions in your forward breeding programs and be able to literally create rare combinations that have never been uh, possible before. We had a great conversation yesterday with the Beechel Borlaug scholars talking about how these simple tools are literally changing the diversity of, of the germplasm pools around the world. A lot of people who think about you know, agriculture think we've narrowed the germplasm base. Nothing could be truer uh, or, or farther from the truth. When we first bought into the corn seed companies like Holden's and DeKalb in the mid-90s, if you looked at their germplasm pool, it was almost all U.S. male by U.S. female. Um, 
you know, B-73 by Missouri-17 would capture a lot of the diversity of U.S. germplasm back in the, uh, in the 80s and 90s. But once the sequencing tools became available in the markers, we could go to that Brazilian breeding program, make that cross that most breeders, once they planted it, would have typically thrown it out because it looks so bad, and actually select and screen for exactly the recombinations that contained only those useful traits and uh, advance them forward. Today, 95% of the U.S. germplasm that we sell brings in genes from other germplasm pools. The di diversity of our genetics has never been greater, and that's really, really critical. And also important just to kind of talk about how it's changed. Last year in our corn breeding program alone, we moved three million packets of seed around the world. So again, that we could take advantage of that selection and screening capability, and then get to the point where every single seed out of those breeding plots could be sampled with robotics so that not only are we breeding every time we make a cross gene by gene, but we're analyzing all of the brothers and sisters seed by seed in order to achieve that selection of absolutely the most desirable uh, characteristics as we go forward. And so unabashedly, I, I tell you one more time, the biggest impact of biotechnology will turn out to be the tools that have literally changed the way we breed crops. And just to take it one more step, this is the corn example, I recognize. Same thing's happening in soybean, it's happening in the other crops, it's happening in all the tomato and peppers, and all of us have the capability, the resources, to basically ensure that it happens with every crop, no matter how big or small, to use these tools effectively uh, in the future. So I have to do a couple of slides on biotech. You'd, you'd expect me to do that, wouldn't you? Um, you know, it's been tremendous to see the, uh, to see the, uh, the adoption. You know, the first biotech crops were launched in the mid-90s, moved very quickly around the world. One of the things I'm most proud of has been the extensive global adoption and the recognition by farmers around the world uh, of the benefits that these, uh, these products have, uh, have created. Today, uh, biotech crops are grown in about 30 countries. Uh, they're grown on over 400 million acres, which is a quick sound bite, is about 20% of the world's uh, farmed land, so it's a, it's a big chunk, and it's going to continue to increase. Uh, we're going to see, you know, new crops, new traits, new combinations of traits, and new geographies uh, continue to, uh, to evolve. In fact, sometime this spring, someone will plant the four billionth cumulative acre of a biotech crop. The reason I point that out and, and this is really important to me, I'm really passionate about this. In now the 30 years that biotech crops have been planted, and in the 20 years that they've been in the market, and in all of those four billion acres, and all the trillions of meals that have been eaten with biotechnology foods around the world, there's not one single incident of food or feed safety. That's really, really important. And that's not just my conclusion, it's the conclusion of all of the experts, and I think there were slides earlier this morning, you know, whether you're on either side of the Atlantic Ocean, there's been, uh, been multiple uh, studies done and, uh, and delivered. Uh, this is the safest, most thoroughly studied source of food in the marketplace today, and there is absolutely no doubt that its benefits in terms of improving yields, reducing chemical inputs, making the lives of farmers more uh, convenient has been uh, a tremendous impact. I grew up on a farm and I can tell you, you can't fool a farmer two years in a row on purchasing a seed. They, they all know their land better than we do. They know their yields. Uh, the reason these technologies have been adopted is real simple. They work. And, and, that's the, uh, and that's the key, and I'm really proud of that. Now, the safety piece is so important, and I know there's, uh, you know, you can go on the internet and you can find all kinds of uh, misinformation and fear-mongering. Let me just tell you how extensive the database is. So as you know, in the U.S., to, to, launch, a bio, to launch a pharmaceutical product in the U.S., I would, if I were the head of an R&D group for a pharmaceutical company, I would get FDA approval, and that's it. 
If I'm going to launch a new corn seed in the U.S., I have to have FDA approval, USDA approval, and EPA approval. But because corn goes to about 20 or 25 countries around the world, I also need the safety and environmental approvals from all of those import countries. These are by far the most thoroughly studied food products uh, that have ever been developed by man, and I would argue that they are the, uh, are the safest. There's always a lot of talk about, uh, well, have there really been studies done and published and communicated? I tallied up, as a single company, Monsanto has published over a thousand studies addressing the food, feed, and environmental safety, and those have all been published. The entire non-commercial industry has published 2,000 papers and, again, came to the same conclusion that these products are as safe, I like to say, even safer because of the thorough knowledge and database. Now, I have managed to accumulate all of these studies on my, uh, my uh, thumb drive and I've given it a chance to give it to many of you. So, you know, I've got my, uh, my corn thumb drive made out of biodegradable corn plastic, and on it is a, uh, is a summary of all of these thousands of studies. Now, I, I didn't think far enough ahead to put a box of them out there for all of you, but if, uh, if you would like to either uh, tweet me or email me, I will promise you that uh, within a week or so of this meeting, I will send you all a copy of that thumb drive with all of those studies that are available so that you're, uh, you're better armed to combat some of the, uh, the misinformation and, and fear mongering that is, uh, that is uh, out there. So that's, a, uh, that's enough talk on, uh, on food and food safety. I want to go now beyond biotech and lay out the case for some of the most phenomenal technologies that are literally building on this information base of biotechnology, you know, the, the knowledge of genes and gene networks and system that I think uh, are going to be really, really important as, in the future. And as I step back, here's one of the reasons that, that I'm so excited. And, you know, as I look into this crowd, and, and yesterday as I was talking to the Beechel Borlaug scholars, one of the reasons I wish I wasn't 61 and I wish I was 23 or 24 or 25 like a lot of these scholars is, the period that we are going to enter into is, I think, the opportunity to be fundamentally transformational for agriculture around the world. And it, it starts with just a, a very simple you know, concept. You know, the two greatest technological revolutions of this century are undoubtedly the advances in biology and the advances in information technology. And they are coming together to create the framework for not only a whole new science, but a whole new way of thinking about products and commerce and agriculture around the world. And, uh, you know, the advances in data science and this uh, space of ag biologicals, which draws again on all this genetic information and insight that can take us to the, uh, to the next level. Let me talk and kind of lay out the case for data science from a couple of, uh, of perspectives. Here's one way I think about it. You know, we think about putting a seed in the ground, planting it, harvesting it uh, as a, you know, kind of a short cycle. You know, I can tell you, watching my dad, you know, struggle with uh, which field would he plant first, uh, when should he uh, manage insects or diseases, how should he cultivate, how should he and when should he harvest, and when should he apply nutrients. There's a lot of complexity. In fact, we've kind of mapped that, you know, whether it's a farmer, big or small, you know, there's 40 or 50 decisions that every farmer is making, either implicitly or explicitly, uh, that can optimize uh, the performance of their crop. Now, I, as a, coming off of a farm, I can tell you that about half the decisions that a farmer makes this next year is based on what they wish they would have done last year. All right. The other third comes from, uh, so you, you grew up on a farm, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The other one is, what has your neighbor done, or what did he do that you thought might be successful? If you're in a farming operation where the dad is still involved, you have to take into account the dad's advice at all times, and then maybe you get down to your agronomic advisor or your, uh, your aide to, uh, to help you. Imagine, and this is exactly where the technology is going, imagine if every one of these decisions was computer modeled and statistically based, based on exactly the current conditions of the field, the moisture levels, the nutrient levels, the stage of the crop, and a very careful and extended outlook at the weather. I can tell you that if you make 40 or 50 decisions, each one 
just slightly better. The net result over a growing season is a tremendous breakthrough in productivity only using data and information science. And I think that's, uh, that is the, uh, the opportunity for the future. We're just starting out in this space. I won't tell you that we're experts. I would tell you that a, a lot of the credit, though, for, uh, for getting us into this space is uh, that vision of Dr. Ted Crosby, who's right in the room right here in the, in the first few rows. You know, he led us into uh, this insight that we now have a neck, a neck, enough genetic knowledge of that corn seed to literally predict which genetics will perform best in one field and which will perform better in another field. And more than that, the fields aren't uniform. You can see that background of, uh, of, uh, of little different colors on the top. That's a difference in yield every 10 meters in a, you know, you know, in a Midwest cornfield. And the reason for that difference is, is there's differences in slope, there's differences in water movement, there's differences in cation capacity, organic matter, soil type, on and on, 60 or 70 parameters. But data science now lets us map that. And in fact, with uh, our own work and with some of the companies that we've uh, been involved with in partnering, we've now mapped 30 million fields in the United States and are now starting to work in South America and other areas around the world to understand how do we take that knowledge literally of the environment, couple that with our knowledge of the propensity of the genetics to perform, and really narrow down that G by E variability that can optimize yield. And this year we'll be starting out with specific recommendations to growers on which hybrid to plant in what field, and then how to vary that population of seed. In the very best parts of the field, farmers should plant more higher density seed. In the lowest parts, they should plant less. Most farmers today still plant a static rate across the field, which means by definition, they're giving up yield on the best part and they're wasting seed on the worst part. That's just a start. Once you vary the seeding population, you need to vary the nutrition. Once you know the, the physical outline of that field, literally meter by meter, you can start to predict where will there be nutrient deficiency and, and selectively target that. Where will there most likely be the disease outbreak? Maybe you don't need to spray the whole field. So this precision ag tools can take us, I think, a, a long way, again, to optimizing yield while uh, reducing inputs as we, uh, as we go forward and think about the, uh, the role of agriculture. And, and this is where it becomes interesting. Because once you're breeding literally gene by gene, and once you're farming meter by meter, a lot of that enormous variability gets reduced. You know, we'll still have weather challenges, but we can take a lot of that variability and complexity out. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with our capabilities. The company that we acquired in California called the Climate Corporation has some of the most sophisticated weather modeling capability that we've ever seen in terms of being able to understand the literally the historical correlation of weather over the last 30 years in all of those 30 million fields as it relates to yield and creates very powerful models on how to be predictive. The screenshot here is, um, you know, is, a, uh, is the set of fields owned by a, by a particular farming operation. Every field has been mapped. Uh, these tools allow us to understand exactly the opportunity to optimize yield, whether it's you know, not all these fields should be planted at the same date. What's the, what's the computer algorithm that says statistically and historically if you plant which fields by what date optimizes yield? Or when do they need, you know, nutrients based on temperature and water movement that of course affects the, uh, the residual uh, nutrition in the field. So cool technologies for the, uh, for the future. And, and this is really the important point. Because I know some of you in the audience are going, why is this guy talking to me about, uh, about you know, computers and you know, technologies like this? This is the absolutely critical point. Much of what I have just talked about can be delivered via a cell phone. And as you know, the, uh, the cell phone not only is, becomes you know, the grower's agronomic advisor, but being able to understand the markets, being understand which, which of the villages nearby is paying the highest price. 
and, and, and take out the middleman. Or, you know, I get into a lot of discussions about the middleman when it comes to loans and usury laws around the world. If, if all of these transactions and microcredit could be done uh, with the cell phone and the credit card, a lot of the mischief that we know goes on could be, uh, could be eliminated. And finally, that cell phone text that says, you know, the wind currents have changed, the temperature conditions are right, we expect to see a flight of moths coming into your, your city or your farming area, and you know, there's a propensity for them to, to lay their eggs and hatch a few days later. Get ready, be prepared, can be game changing in terms of, of improving. So we're doing these, uh, these plots at a pretty big scale. Today, we reach over a million Indian small farmers with, uh, with cell phone advisory techs on, uh, on farming and agricultural practices. And I think this tool can uh, and is already being tested in parts of Africa, parts of Mexico here, to extend its, uh, its, uh, its reach. This is why I make the case so strong on these advanced biology and information technology tools. Um, it's this simple. We can take gene sequencing, we can take markers, we can take heterosis, and we can take biotech traits, and we can package it in a seed. And in all my travels around the world, I've never seen a farmer, big or small, who didn't know what to do with a better seed. The barriers to adoption are not gigantic investments. They're not the intellectual property laws that people like to talk about. It's strictly policy. Uh, these tools can, can transform uh, uh, the smallest and the largest of growers. And similarly, it's the same thing that's true of these information technology tools. Admittedly, you know, if, if you've got a big John Deere tractor and it's got a computer, that's one thing. But the cell phone becomes the great equalizer, and as you know, even in some of the poorest countries in the world, the population and the per capita you know, ratio of phones to individuals is, is growing enormously. And I think it's very safe to assume that in any farming operation anywhere in the world or certainly in any village or family, you know, these tools, both of which have virtually no barrier to adoption and utilization, are going to be uh, transformational. They're scale neutral and uh, they really have reduced barriers to adoption. I'm going to change gears. I'm going to speed up and talk about two new technology platforms based on, uh, on biologicals that I think have, uh, have really profound effects uh, and areas that we're uh, starting to explore. One of them is BioDirect, which is based on a, a new uh, way of using the RNAi technology, and the other are, uh, are microbial pesticides, again, taking advantage of all of the new advances in biology that create, I think, uh, tremendous uh, opportunities for the future. And these are really both built on our genomics, our biotechnology, our GMO insights that have generated uh, new ways of thinking about these opportunities. For me, one of the most remarkable things I've seen, and you know, I, I, I confessed already earlier my age and, and my bias. I mean, I, uh, I was there at the beginning of, uh, of the work in the 80s to introduce genes into plants and helped invent technologies like Roundup Ready soybeans or the BT genes in corn and cotton. But the opportunity that some of these new platforms represent, like RNAi, I think are, uh, are mind-boggling. So when I was a graduate student learning biochemistry and molecular biology at the University of Illinois, the central dogma of biology was the gene made the messenger RNA, which was the intermediate, which everybody ignored because it was so fragile and you couldn't work with it. Then you got onto the protein that was the business end. And so almost all the work that's been done has either been done on the gene or the protein. As you know, the, the Nobel Prize was given to, to, uh, to Mello and, uh, and Fire uh, you know, about 15 years ago for their discovery that you know, it just wasn't quite that easy. That in addition, there's a whole regulatory system based on these small RNAi molecules that on a gene-specific basis can interact with the RNA and cause for an autocatalytic degradation to basically knock that gene out from an expression perspective. And it's, it creates tremendous opportunity because you can not only, you know, knock the, uh, the product out to, uh, to reduce a protein expression, but if that protein is a repressor, you're actually increasing expression. So the opportunity to use these tools selectively for a variety of, uh, of applications has been, you know, very transformational in both human medicine, where people are looking at RNAIs to target, you know, cancer cells and disease states. And, of course, we've used this technology already in some of our new insect control 
control transgenic products where we're introducing uh, a gene DNA sequence that produces an RNAi that specifically can knock out a key gene in the insect. But the real breakthrough that I want to talk about is the observation that we can now mass produce these small RNAi sequences and actually formulate them and actually get enough of the RNAi into a plant or into a plant pest to elicit very gene-specific uh, uh, regulation of, uh, of gene expression. And this is the example that got us excited. Up on the upper left-hand panel, is a weed that's become a serious problem in the U.S. that's resistant to glyphosate or our Roundup herbicide. And you can see it's been sprayed and it survives nicely. Our scientists sequenced the genes in the Palmer pigweed and they understood what is the mechanism by which that weed became resistant to glyphosate. And then they took it one step further. They designed specific RNAi sequences that would only interact with that resistance gene protein product in the messenger RNA. And when just a few grams per acre of those RNAi molecules are now mixed with the Roundup, you can see the effects on the bottom panel. Enough of that RNAi gets in, knocks out the resistance mechanism specifically in the weed, and enables the herbicide to, to be effective. And we've demonstrated that now with multiple different weeds, and we've also now extended it to a whole host of other weed control products, the imidazolones, the sulfonylureas, the HPPD chemistry, where we can overcome resistance with this approach. And uh, before I uh, forget, I'll just move backwards, and I won't have time to talk about it, but in addition to helping to control resistant weeds, we can design these RNAi molecules to specifically knock out a key gene in an insect, spray that RNAi on the, uh, the, the plant and protect it. Very effective has been designing these RNAi's to knock out and interfere with virus replication, even to the point where we can take a plant that's infected with virus, apply an RNAi, because that's an autocatalytic biochemical reaction, it will actually mitigate the virus infection. And finally, one of my favorite examples that you know, we're still continuing to work with is bee health. As you know, there's been a lot of conversations around colony collapse disorder and a lot of, you know, you know I'd say explanations and some of them, you know, inflammatory in terms of what causes it. The, the science shows that colony collapse disorder is caused by a mite on the bee that injects viruses that, that weaken the bee and, uh, and kill it. And we've been able to show that if we design RNAIs to the mite and RNAIs to some of these viruses, put that into a, a diet to the bees that we can actually mitigate bee health. So some pretty cool examples of this science. We've come a long way. When we first got into this space a few years ago, a, uh, a gram of, uh, of RNAI cost about $50,000. Uh, today, it's uh, probably between $10 and $20 a gram. Uh, and so it's uh, spectacular and, and uh, progress, but still work to do to get these molecules in and get them in more effectively. So last space I'll talk about is the, uh, the opportunity with microbes. And, and here the, uh, the story is very different. Um, again, catalyzed by, by the advances in biology. We now have the capability every time we pull up a, a root of a corn plant or a soybean plant to literally sequence all of the, the, uh, the microbiological genomes on that root, characterize which ones are the most effective and which ones particularly are protecting that plant from pests or providing micronutrients that serve as a factory. You know, when we tour the, uh, the wheat fields here or the cor corn fields around Obregon, everybody's always looking at that, uh, all that biomass above the ground. When you think of a corn plant, the roots go down at least as deep as the plant goes up in the air. And when you start dissecting each one of those micro roots and, and, and hair roots, there's about two or three miles of roots for every plant. And the opportunity now to coat those roots with a seed treatment that can further enhance nutrition or address uh, uh, pest control and reduce chemical pesticide usage, I think, has, uh, has tremendous value. And I think it's a, a really a renaissance of being able to target and screen microbes and then use this information technology to, uh, to, uh, to move us forward. So I'm going to uh, close and just make a couple of points. 
Partnerships uh, are, are critical. No one company can do this. As a Monsanto, I can tell you, we now have three or 4,000 active licensing or partnering agreements with, with small companies, large companies, NGOs, universities, and that's key. Probably a point I, I would make is, I think this also sets a completely new era for public-private partnerships. The, the tools and cost curves for breeding and biotechnology have come down enormously. New tools for information technology and, uh, and biologicals, I think, reset the, uh, the opportunity for working together in a broad space uh, to uh, deliver uh, products and uh, allow all of the capabilities that, that come from these relationships to, uh, to provide for, uh, for faster uh, adoption and broader distribution of the products and technology. The two I would highlight, uh, the Beechel Borlaug, uh, was, was pretty special to me. Ted and I had a chance to, to visit Norm just before he passed away in his home in Dallas. And his one request was, who's going to carry on the next generation of research in rice and wheat? So we funded the Beechel Borlaug uh, Scholarship. There's 64 scholars who now, you know, are being trained in rice and wheat breeding, and uh, you know that is a that is an important part of the. Uh, of Dorm's legacy that I think will uh, will pay uh, big dividends. Last one I, I would highlight is the Wima project in Africa. It's f for me, it's been one of the, the biggest and most impactful private-public partnerships. It's involved Simit here. It's involved uh, it's involved the Gates Foundation, uh, African uh, institutions, as well as Monsanto. We've donated uh, germplasm and traits and know-how. Uh, Simit has been particularly uh, uh, kind in, in donating so much of their experience in, uh, in producing uh, drought tolerant, tolerant maize, and this thing is, uh, is moving quickly. We were just talking this morning, you know, we'll have uh, over a dozen uh, hybrids. These, the first ones will be non-biotech, and the, and the goal of this collaboration is to produce both non-biotech and biotech uh, hybrids. And, you know, I'd just like to thank uh, both uh, Prasanna and Marion for, uh, for their effort and support. Without this kind of a collaboration, uh, we would have never gotten to the point where the Wema project has now become, you know, the largest hybrid corn breeding program in Central Africa and it's incorporating, uh, you know, genetics from multiple sources to deliver uh, um, uh, opportunities for, uh, for Kenyan farmers this year. I think this kind of model can literally work for, uh, for, every, uh, for every crop, and we need to make sure that that happens. So as I close, um, you know, coming back to Norm, uh, you know, he set the standard for innovation. But if we dissect that innovation, it was not only the research and development that, that Norm contributed, but it was at his attitude towards building stakeholders and partners. And the last thing I'd highlight is his unique style in championing and, and advocating the importance of new tools for growers and, uh, and new technologies. You know, one of the things when I first met Norm that he told me on a, on a personal level was people don't realize how hard this is. You know, there will always be opposition to what you do, and you've got to be prepared to fight for it and make it happen. You know, he told me the story that, believe it or not, all those short stature Mexican wheats arriving in Pakistan and India weren't really well received by everybody. There was opposition, you know, and it was kind of cute because he told me the story that, uh, that uh, you know, the rumors that were going around for the farmers who had planted this wheats were that if you plant these uh, short stature Mexican wheats in a Pakistani soil or an Indian soil, that your soils would be sterile. And if your kids would ever eat these wheats, they too would be sterile. You know, 50 years later, I hear the same stories. Um, and that's not to trivialize it. And, and to build on that, that's what where we need to do. We all need to become champions and advocates. Not blind. We know the science. We know the impact. We know the importance. And, you know, my request is that all of you think about how you amplify your message. Particularly, and this is going to be uncomfortable for you, because I know it was uncomfortable for me, but social media in particular, has become the preferred venue by which consumers around the world are getting to their information. So while, you know, we're doing advertisements on TV, most of the millennial generation probably doesn't watch TV, or, you know, they've already set their computer on their television to skip through the commercials already. Uh, or, you know, the scholarly publication just doesn't get picked up. Uh, in many ways, it's not a technical problem. 
It's an emotional one. Every one of you in this room has an emotional story on your link to agriculture, the importance of technology, the importance of innovation for food security that can be told. I really urge all of you to go back, talk to your students, set up networks that uh, can be supported and amplified, and take all of those great scholarly uh, efforts, translate them into the sound bites, deliver them in the fashion that consumers around the world can, uh, can, uh, can understand. And that will really make a huge difference in terms of building the support and the, uh, and the outreach as we go forward. So with that, Perry, I know you want me to uh, step down here, and I'm glad you didn't pull the trap door. I want to thank you again for, uh, for, your, uh, you know, for the passion that, uh, that you have for this. It's, uh, it's very special and very palpable. Thanks.